My name is Rob Egan. Let me go to the first slide. Um, and uh, I'm a developer for MetaHitmer, which is an application in the field of genomics, tackling very large data graphs. Uh, personally, I've been using UPC++ for just a few months now, uh, though I've programmed with MPI and UPC for a number of years. Um, and I'd like to share some of our use cases uh, with UPC in our application uh, recently. So first off, a little bit of science. Um, the, the background of the application is that we're, we're working with metagenomes, and metagenomes are all around us in the environment, the oceans, lakes, soils, our guts, uh, the cow gut, which is another one that's important. Um, we, we're studying the collection of organisms in the environment, so it's critical for many areas of science, like health and environment and bioenergy. Um, but these large data sets have proven very difficult to handle because of their complexity, the repetitiveness of the genomes, and the computing resources that are required for these. So it's really an extra-scale project to um, tackle some of these large um, environmental samples. Um, so to investigate a metagenome, one needs to first sample the environment and then do a little bit of lab work, some wet work, uh, to isolate the DNA. Then we use uh, these com commercial sequencers that you can buy on the market. They've been around for a couple of decades now. Um, and these, these sequencers uh, produce small fragments of DNA, or the, or the, the, the sequence of DNA that, the, that it observes. Um, these reads are on the order of 100 to 300 bases, sometimes longer with higher error rates. But um, the thousands of genomes that we want to observe in these in the environments um, each have five to 20 million bases that you're trying to look for in the, in the single sequence. So the data that we're receiving is orders of magnitude smaller than the things we're trying to get together. And one way to think about it is you can think of a meta metagenome assembly as a giant trillion piece jigsaw puzzle of about a thousand different pictures, each with each picture is about one to a thousand copies of the picture, but maybe at different angles. And each of these little pieces are made of cardboard and it's been raining and it's been outside, so it's a little damage to each one of those pieces. So it's a very hard problem, it's an MP hard problem, and there's no way to actually get 100% correct or complete, but we can uh, generate very useful results with uh, some software and some uh, that we've been working on. Um, so a little bit of history of our assembler. Uh, first there was uh, Miraculous, which is uh, basically a set of Perl scripts that was written um, a couple, of, you know, maybe almost eight, nine years ago. Um, not, not by us, but by another group. Um, and uh, it, you know, it worked, it did a good job on assembly, but only worked on small genomes. We were only work on one machine. Um, they transformed that into work on a cluster, so it was faster, but not necessarily very efficient. Um, they, they did some operations where they exploded some data structures on disks because they couldn't fit it all in memory. Um, then they did some more work to make it faster, even still by transforming a lot of this Perl into C++, but still not really efficient. And then about in 2014, uh, a, a postdoc uh, uh, that we're working with, uh, Evangelist Koganis, um, tackled this problem and tried to translate all these Perl algorithms into UPC and MPI um, and, and get that to work on supercomputers so we could tackle these very large problems that you really couldn't tackle before. Um, this application uh, we call HITMER, or meta, it transformed into MetaHITMER to be able to work on metagenomes. Um, and it works uh, much faster, much scalable than the original Perl, obviously. Um, and uh, used uh, MPI, and um, uh, we had some issues of interrupting between MPI and UBC. So recently, we've been trying to transform um, some of the, the code from UPC into UPC++ and also from MPI into UPC++. Um, recently, uh, Steve Hoffmeyer, who I think is on the call, um, developed uh, the, uh, both these applications to uh, transform them, the modules into uh, UPC++. And uh, particularly with the graph scaling and also the MPI, uh, we, we, we found that uh, the UPC++ algorithm lended itself much better to the problems that we're looking at. Um, partially because it's more maintainable code because it seemed to compress a lot of the code that we did. Um, yeah, obviously we refactored it so it was easier to work with on the second time around. Um, but also because uh, we were using a lot of MPI auto exchanges in, in batches and that caused a lot of synchronous uh, operations. Um, and the asynchronous uh, workflow of UPC++ fit, fit our problem much better. Um, and then all, 
All, additionally, we were able to use memory of the node much more efficiently because both the UPC code and the UPC++ code could share uh, the same memory segment, so we didn't have to partition the memory too much. Uh, but this is again, it's, it's ongoing work and we're still, uh, still transforming code to, to make better and better um, uh, conditions. Um, so uh, this is just an overview of the workflow that we're working on. And I'm, I'm going to talk mostly about uh, step number one. But for each one of these steps, we have uh, both UPC and UPC++ code that we're, we're trying to um, integrate into our application. Um, but the first stage is to uh, transform these short reads into kind of even shorter camers. And these camers are sequences um, that are easier to work with in memory because they're all fixed length and you can, um, you can stack them on and, and look for um, the correct ones versus the incorrect ones. Um, so uh, the goal of, of counting the k-mers is to uh, find the genomic k-mers, so the ones that are representative in the genome as opposed to the ones that are erroneous because of there's errors in the reads or there's uh, differences in, in one species or strain versus another. Um, so what the goal is to count these cameras and uh, consolidate them into uh, the re re consolidate the redundancy of the reads into uh, a single data structure. And to do that, we build it into a distributed hash table, uh, much like uh, the one that Emmer uh, talked about before. Um, so what we do is we store these counts and these kind of extensions of the counts so we can connect these k-mers into a, a single graph or a different graph that we can then traverse later. So uh, at first uh, blush, the, the, the code actually is pretty simple. Um, we, we build the distributed hash table. It's actually a, 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 a distributed object in, in EPC++. And then we iterate over all the input files and input iterate over all the reads within those files, and then iterate with all, all the k-mers within those reads, and do an insert into the distributed hash table, uh, which calls the RPC that, that, that does the actual insert itself. Um, then once everything's loaded, then we can traverse the graph and work on the graph and do the cool things that we need to do to assemble. Um, and that works. But there are really trillions of k-mers in some of these data sets. And um, that one step of doing the fine grain inserts um, actually is, is quite weight, rate limiting. And if we're trying to make a high performance application, uh, we would be uh, leaving a lot of performance on the table if we had every one of these trillion updates uh, send a message over the network. Um, one of these uh, graphs, I think Amira showed a couple of graphs like similar to this um, in, in the tutorial. Um, but one of the things that, that that's, that's uh, a feature of this network is that small messages kind of have low bandwidth and large messages have higher bandwidth. So if there's a way to aggregate these insertions or updates in the distributed graph to be more than just 64 bytes of message, they can maybe make it two, two kilobytes of message, the network cost or the network time to transfer would drop from about 500 seconds to 15 seconds um, because of this, this extra bandwidth you get when you can aggregate these messages. So what we did is we uh, developed a, a way to aggregate these messages so that every time you update or you insert into the table, instead of sending the RPC first, it would uh, insert into a local buffer. And then when that buffer is full, it would then send uh, the UPC progress, uh, the UPC call to the remote process, which would then iterate over all the items of that buffer and return back. Um, so the... Um, the update call um, would be the one in the inner loop that would be called the trillion times across the whole pro process. And then we would then send maybe maybe only 100 million messages across the network instead of that. Um, so um, there are kind of two stages to it. What One is to do the updates, and then the last is to finally uh, flush all these updates for the remaining entries in the buffer um, after you've done this insertion thing. And this is kind of a, an example. Um, it's not quite all the code, but it, it's it's a kind of a toy toy example of what we would actually do. Um, the uh, distrib distributed objects is, is uh, defined above, and then we call RPC fire and forget method to um, to the target rank, and um, send an update. 
Um, but that also has a problem uh, where uh, even at scale, these messages would get kind of small because if you have 10,000 processes, that means that you can only store a little bit of data in each one of the buffer for each of these processes. So we enhanced this method of updating into a two-tier approach where uh, we have one buffer for every local process on the node and then one buffer for every other node in the, uh, in the, in the job. So that um, we kind of have two different um, RPC, different, two types of, of RPC calls. One we call intra-node, which would be within the local uh, processes of the node. And one would be inter-node, which would uh, send uh, one message to the, to the remote node, which would then relay the, all, all of the data structures into the intra-node uh, uh, destination processes within that remote node. If that makes sense. Um, so this way, instead of having p buffers, which where p is uh, capital P is is the number of processes in the job, which could be tens of thousands. Now uh, we only need um, a lowercase p of uh, how many nodes we have plus how many processes uh, per node within that node. So the, the number of buffers we need is much less, much smaller, and we can have a um, much larger message size per message. Um, so this here is just the API of, of the, um, the library that we've built on top of UPC++. Um, it takes a uh, functor, or actually a distributed object functor, um, as one of its template arguments, and then it takes the type that you're going to work on. Um, and what we did is to make this abstract so they can work on a hash table or, or basically any other structure that you need to send a lot of data through. The functor has a it captures a reference to the underlying data that it needs, and this 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 data could be a vector, it could be a hash table, it could be any sort of linked list, it could be a, any kind of complicated array you want. Um, and then all we need to define is operator. So what do you want to do for every element you do? What do you want to work on this this data structure? Um, and then within the um, the ag store template library that we built. Um, we expect you just to construct it with the functor object uh, as a reference, and then just call update however many times you want in your, in your inner loop, and then at the end of it, call flush updates, and then you're done. Um, and then you're guaranteed that every element has, has had this functor's operator applied to it at the end of the flush updates. Um, so here I want to go through a little bit of code since it's a tutorial. Um, so on the left hand side is what the source rank would be executing. So it would grab one of its buffers and do the append. And then if the data in that buffer is full, it will call the RPC target. Uh, it will initiate the RPC on the remote node, wherever it happens to be. And then once that uh, target's been done. I'll use a future chain and push that buffer back on its heap and then grab a brand new buffer so I can continue inserting data into calling this update function. And then on the remote node, uh, via the UPC progress operation, so whenever the remote node decides to run progress, it'll execute the Lambda function that the source node uh, asks for. And uh, here I'm taking advantage of the, um, uh, I want to use the right, right term, the uh, uh, shared memory bypass of, um, uh, of, of UPC, which, which allows me to have this, this uh, global pointer that is local to the node um, be downcast into a regular UPC uh, uh, C++ type. So here I, I, I assert that this global, this global pointer is local, and then if it is, then I cast it into, or it, it is because it's an intranode uh, transfer cast it into a C++ type, and then just apply my functor over it, and then return the source. And then the internode RPC is just a little more complicated. Again, this one is the one that relays the data that is from a remote node, and then it relays it internally to the processes within it that, that it can see locally. Um, and again, the source rank just calls updates, and then if it's full, it sends the buffer via RPC. And then inside the RPC, it will pop a brand new buffer off of its stack. Um, it will make a trivial to future of the source buffer that, that it received from the, um, uh, from the remote uh, source. 
And then I, I do uh, a couple future chains. So when the remote buffer and the, uh, so w w when the new receiving buffer and the source buffer are both ready, then I'll call remote get, um, copy of the source to destination, so just array copy. Um, once the remote gets done, then it will actually apply an update, that same update function uh, to distribute the data to all the local processes. Then it will return um, that uh, data, which happens to be the, the the buffer it copied into. Push that back on its own stack, and then it will return the source buffer back to the original source, so that it can then uh, reuse that buffer again. Um, and for our um, conversion of uh, this application from originally MPI camera counting to UPC camera counting, we, we found that it actually sped up things very, very much. Um, I contribute this mostly to uh, a number of factors. It's not just because uh, UPC++ is, is faster overall, that's not, that's not necessarily always true. Um, we did refactor the code, and obviously you always get uh, improvements when you, when you relook at your algorithm. Um, and uh, I think a lot of the, the speed up is actually because we don't do these batch syncs that MPI all, all required us to do. So the, on the left-hand side is MPI. Um, it's very similar in that we, we uh, still buffer the data into uh, a data structure. It happens to be structured a little bit differently, but it is for every, um, uh, for every rank, it has a little bit of data that it sends. And then at the end, once any one of those ranks is full, it will call this all to all V and synchronously uh, exchange all the data to all the other ranks. And when it's all done, then uh, you just do, you have an end condition to make sure that all uh, processes are done. Um, but we found that with UPC++, uh, the asynchronous nature of it lended itself to the problem much better, and we got about five times speed up. Uh, we also had other issues with MPI that we couldn't make this, this data buffer very big because otherwise the MPI implementation would run out of memory because it didn't have enough space for its own networking buffer. Um, so you, you, it wouldn't scale as, as well as our two-tiered solution in um, uh, EPC++. And um, the other kind of deficiency of the synchronous app, uh, algorithm is that once any of these buffers is full, then you have to do all the buffers you're sent. Uh, whereas with asynchronous uh, uh, communication, you can make sure that every buffer is full by the time that it gets sent. Um, so we didn't necessarily uh, set out to make a faster application. And the primary motivation for transforming this to MPI to UPC++ was, was other uh, aspects of uh, linking and memory and threading models that we were restricted in using. Um, but UPC++ and UPC seem to interrupt a little bit better than MPI plus UPC. So uh, last couple slides, I wanted to go over um, some lessons learned and, and, and kind of have a little tutorial. Um, I was hoping to kind of be in person, so I might just run through these slides and, and not ask questions in case, unless people do have questions, which um, I don't necessarily think I can see in this view of mine. Um, no, I don't see any questions. Um, so uh, one of the things is this is the flush updates method uh, that you call at the end of all the updates that we perform. And this, this first implementation had a couple problems and I wanted to kind of show some of the issues that we had with it. So just go over it really quickly. There's a barrier because all the, all, it is, all the updates that the application needs to do have to be completed because of our algorithm. Um, then you iterate over all the ranks, call the one last RPC in all the ranks, and then do a barrier. And the first thing that, that we noticed was that um, it didn't quite work at scale. And the reason was because we didn't call progress in the middle of it. And the reason because it didn't work at scale is because we don't quite have enough resources for all the ranks to be able to, to uh, buffer up all the, the, uh, the RPCs before it starts doing anything. So if you, we called progress in the middle of it, uh, then that alleviates that problem. But it had another problem in that the way that this was, was written with everything starting at rank zero, um, all the uh, processes initially sent their message to rank zero and that overloaded rank zero. So it spent all its time doing its own progress and none of its time sending its own RPCs. So it was the last to finish. 
Um, so if you stagger the way that you send your RPCs, then that alleviates that problem and nothing that gets overloaded uh, at the very beginning. Um, this only really happens because we actually have a barrier in the beginning, but um, it's possible to happen at any point in time. Um, and then the last thing that I want to talk about is uh, the amount of progress that one needs to actually uh, call. And uh, I mean, this is a pun, it is a work in progress for our own thing, and it's actually, we're talking about the work within the progress routine. Um, so uh, what happens is that if you don't call progress enough, I've found that um, we have a limitation of the number of resources that are being used, obviously, because of trying to work with things at scale. So your, pro your process might start falling behind in processing received RPCs. And then conversely, if you call progress too much, so you maybe call it every time in the inner loop, um, then it's very possible that your that process is going to call fall behind in the sending of its RPCs. So all the other ranks will have sent their RPCs before you've really started sending yours. Um, and a lot of the problem is because our data isn't perfectly load balanced. Um, there's some locality issues. There's the composition. There's ordering. Um, so that we are sensitive to being perturbed in this way that, that maybe some applications like a, you know, a straight up grid matrix wouldn't necessarily be done. Um, so I found that, that what I needed to do is kind of tune the amount of progress uh, depending on the actual state of the application at the time. And this seemed to actually work pretty well for us. So basically if I detect that I have received less RPCs than I've sent, I'll call progress less frequently, maybe once every 32 times. But if I found that I have sent more RPCs than I've received, then I'll call it very infrequently because I need to <clears throat> um, catch up and, and, and let the other, I, I, I've, this process has gotten too far forward and the other processes need to catch up to it. And this has a, seemed to alleviate a lot of our load balances. But again, this is a work in progress and something we're still working on. Um, so <clears throat> last thing I want to do is my last slide, and then I'm going to hand it over to Matthias, <clears throat> um, is some future developments. So the, the previous optimizations were for optimizing the distributed hash find operation. Um, uh, sorry, the, 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 we're, we're to optimize the distributed hash uh, update operation or insert op operation. And the next step is to kind of optimize the find operation. Um, and the first one would be to create a local cache which uses the shared memory bypass within a node so that all the members of a, all the processes within a single node can share a larger cache buffer and avoid a lot of communication from all the remote nodes if there's a reuse of the data that, that we expect. Um, and then the second uh, class that we'd like to work with and make an optimization is make an aggregate query. So instead of uh, making fine grained queries for every uh, lookup, we would um, make a, um, a, a an aggregated query so that a uh, hundred queries or so could be returned at once from a certain node instead of asking one at a time. So with that, um, thank you very much. This link here contains the slides. Uh, among them is uh, contact information for us on the first page. 